How's it going everybody? My name's Dave Whipple and you're watching Bush Radical. In the last couple episodes we've talked about the subject of off-grid homesteading. That is buying a piece of land, moving on to the piece of land, setting yourself up for a temporary living arrangement. In this episode we're going to talk about the tools that you would need to have in order to ha have a, at least a very basic kit to get started homesteading a piece of raw land. So when it comes to homesteading, basically you can look at it like this. You're going to need three different categories of tools. You're going to need land clearing and land development tools. You're going to need construction and carpentry tools. And you're going to need maintenance tools. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at each one of those three sets of tools. Not only is there going to be the tool, but why you would need that tool. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you possibly the most important tool that you can have. Stay tuned. Think about the 1800s. Imagine you're watching a western and there's a covered wagon heading across the prairie towards California. The stuff that would be on a covered wagon in the 1800s is pretty much the same stuff you'd need today to clear land, to clear timber, to clear brush, to prune trees, to dig holes. Basically the tools are still exactly the same stuff that they'd use 150 years ago. Let me give you an example. Let's start with the very basics. The shovel. Boom! Now this is a square nosed shovel. And a good shovel is about as good as a good shovel. That's about all there is to it. Buy a quality tool. It's hard to find a really poor quality shovel. It's hard to find a super high quality shovel. A shovel's a shovel. Just make sure you like the handle and uh, there's no cracks in it if you're buying used for a buck or two. What you're going to want, you're going to want a square shovel. And you're going to want a round shovel. Generally, you're going to pay a dollar or two for a decent shovel at a yard sale or a flea market. You're going to need a couple shovels. You probably already have them. Hey, of all the tools that you're going to need for homesteading, nothing is more important than the shovel. You're going to find uses for it every single day. You're never going to run out of things you need it for. You're never going to come to the point where it's like, I don't need to shovel anymore because I don't need to dig anymore. You're always going to need a shovel. Just beyond the shovel is a rake. Two kinds of rakes. There's the big, wide, broad leaf rake, and then there's the narrow, steel-tined kind of a garden rake. Our steel-tined rake is in the Upper Peninsula on a piece of property that we're hoping to build a cabin on this summer. And that rake's doing the duty it's meant to do up there, which is kind of rougher rake work. A post hole digger. You're going to want a post sooner or later for one reason or another, or a hole in the ground that goes straight down. Not a whole lot of thought needs to be put into this. Buy yourself a set of post hole diggers uh, the next time you're at a flea market or a yard sale and you see a set for five or ten bucks. You take a look at these guys. Here's two different style of hose for the garden. Now homesteading and gardening kind of go hand in hand. A lot of people have it in their head that um, homesteading is all about growing your own food. That's very legitimate. Other people might want to want a cabin somewhere in the woods where there's not a ton of opportunity to garden and that's legitimate too but realistically I would put the hose on the must-have list too because they do a lot more than just garden work hose are good for digging out roots of uh, saplings around campsites and stuff not only that but here's a fun fact that a lot of people don't know the hoe is better for digging yourself out of being stuck in the snow than a shovel is a lot of times. If you're high centered on a snowbank, a shovel is only going to get so far under a vehicle. But with a hoe, you can reach under and scoop the snow out and let your vehicle get back down to solid ground so you can drive out. So a hoe is kind of like the, the super secret tool for, uh, for winter travel. If you've got a shovel in your truck, if you've got a hoe in your truck, you can not only dig yourself out, but you can also get off high center. If you like get up on a snow berm or a hard packed snow bank or drift and your tires don't touch the ground, the hoe's the tool. Very few things are as synonymous with off-grid living as wood heat. And just like everything else in off-grid living, when it comes to firewood, you just need a simple set of tools. Let me run down a few things that I use that I, I think are pretty much essential items if you're going to do firewood as a home heating source. Of course you're going to need an axe. Why are you going to need an axe? You're not really going to need an axe to fell trees unless you really want to work your butt off. You're going to need an axe to split wood. And why do I say you need an axe to split wood? I find, and I've always found, that 
a good blunt hardware store axe works better for splitting wood than a maul 90% of the time because it doesn't wear you out and if the wood is conducive to being split an axe will do the job. There's a pretty small window in my opinion where a splitting maul really shines. What I've always found over the years is if a piece of wood is too resistant to being split that it, it, the axe doesn't split it and you're beating yourself to death with the axe there's a good chance that a maul is probably not going to split it either and you're going to have to go to a wedge. Now uh, this is your basic splitting wedge and if you have a wedge and a maul to use as a sledgehammer you can split anything. You can split anything under the sun with a wedge and a sledgehammer. So if you've got, uh, if you're cutting big timber and uh, you cut around off a big log and you tip it over you might be able to work your way around it with an axe but to try to split it into a half or into a quarter is probably going to be next to impossible and I would say the same thing with a maul. You're going to have this small window where a maul is going to work and then you're just going to be beating yourself to death trying to use a maul the same way you were beating yourself to death trying to use an axe but, uh, but a wedge will split that block of wood get it down into a quarter and then with a quarter if you have a log splitter you can get a quarter of a big round maybe up onto a log splitter and finish splitting it out. Let's talk about chainsaws. If, unless you live somewhere that doesn't have trees, the chainsaw is one of the first things that you're going to want. Now between Brooke and I we have four chainsaws. We have a steel 025, a steel 034 which is a, like a 60cc saw, it's a pretty good sized saw, and we have two of these little echo chainsaws. What you really need is you need a good reliable chainsaw that's going to cut wood when you want to cut wood with it. So what saw do you buy? <laughs> I'm not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole. You know it's like the Ford Chevy Dodge thing. I'm not going to tell you to buy a Husqvarna. I'm not going to tell you to buy a Steel. I'm not going to tell you to buy an Echo or a Shindawa or a Dolmar or whatever. What I am going to tell you is buy a saw where there is a dealer locally that has all the parts that you might need. If you go to the box store and you buy yourself a Poland or a McCullough, those are old brands that used to make real saws and they sold the brands off to some other big company. I think Husqvarna owns a lot of those brands. The saws are made in Vietnam and China and uh, they'll work for a short amount of time, maybe a long amount of time if you take care of them. Uh, if you break something in them, you're not going to get parts for them. You are going to, uh, you're going to be in a situation where you go buy a good saw or you just go buy another junk saw. Buy a chainsaw where there is a dealer locally that can get you the parts that you need for that saw. They just don't have the parts available for McCullough's and Poland's, Poulon's and uh, what are the other ones? You want to kind of go with like that big three or big four. Husqvarna is probably getting to be the biggest player in the market. They've bought up a lot of other saw companies. Husqvarna has dealerships. They've got parts. I don't own a Husqvarna. I don't have any real insight to pass on to you about Husqvarna. I know a lot of guys own Huskies. They love them. They swear by the brand. I'm just not as familiar with that brand, but I would recommend it for the fact that it's a brand where you can buy parts for it. If something breaks, if something gets lost, vibrates off, what have you, you can go to a Husqvarna dealer and they will get you the parts. They'll probably have them in store. Same thing goes for steel. Same thing goes for Echo. Uh, Echo's dealerships, uh, their Echo string trimmers are, are probably the best out there. Their chainsaws, they're a little tame. They can stand a little bit of dialing in, but the, they're just great saws. I've really loved them. Now the other thing that's important to consider is you want a chainsaw that can take just a regular standard chisel chain. A lot of saws you buy are going to come with an anti-kickback chain. Anti-kickback chains are basically anti-cutting wood chains. They cut at half the rate. They don't grab as well. They don't kick back. But you know if you're running a chainsaw all the time, you, you get accustomed to the feel of the saw. You don't need the anti-kickback chain. It's basically like a lawyer chain. It's a safety chain that for people who might be, maybe it's their first chainsaw and they run it five minutes a year and they're just afraid of it. The only reason you'd ever want to own a chainsaw at all is to cut through wood. 
it doesn't have another purpose. Its whole existence is based around cutting firewood. So why would you put a chain on it that makes it cut wood slower, makes you put more effort and time into it? When you buy a saw, if it's got an anti-kickback chain, make sure that it isn't one of these freak shows that only takes an anti-kickback chain. You want to be able to cut wood with the saw. Or, or, or why own one? Now if you're shopping for a chainsaw and you, it's just all numbers. You know, this is the 450X, this is the 370XP. Basically, there's, there's a range of chainsaws from about 30 cc's up to about 60 cc's that's going to be the homeowner saws. Small, small saws in, in that 30, 35 cc range. They're plenty good for, for cutting firewood for working around the house. Once you get up to about 40 cc's, you know, that's a decent firewood saw that's lightweight, easy to use. It's gonna do fine. You can't push it a ton, but it's gonna be, gonna be a good saw. I, I cut a lot of firewood with this, and it's under a 40 cc saw. When you start getting into that 59 cc saw, you've got a saw with a lot of power. You might need that power, you might not need that power. If you're running like a chainsaw jig, like a Grand Spurge jig, uh, you're going to need a 59 cc and over. If you're running like a head and lumber jig, like you've seen in my videos where I was two-siding logs, you can two-side logs with any chainsaw. It doesn't have to be a big one. Uh, but the Grandsburg where you're making boards, that has to be a bigger saw. When it comes to saw maintenance, basically all you're going to need is something to loosen up the nuts that hold your bar on, and you're going to need something to adjust your chain. Now that tool is a scrunch. It's a T-shaped wrench. It's got a, two different socket sizes on one end than a screwdriver. I'd show you, but you probably already know what I'm talking about anyway, and I don't have one with me at the moment. As far as chain maintenance goes, uh, you can sharpen your chain just with a standard old chainsaw file, which I've used for years. A friend of mine who passed away, unfortunately, a few months back, sent me this chainsaw sharpener. This is a still brand chainsaw sharpener. Now this guy is a little confusing to use because it's got like four different ways. But what it does is it sharpens the tooth of the saw and it cuts down the raker or the depth gauge at the same time. So it, it's kind of, once you figure it out, it's, it's pretty much idiot proof and it does a good job. The other thing about this sharpener that I absolutely love is uh, it, it's almost kind of aggressive. When you're taking the rakers down, it takes them down a pretty, pretty fair amount. So your saw bites and, and cuts good and quick. Generally, I'm very skeptical of new products because a lot of them just have this stupid nanny factor built in where, you know, it needs to be safe and it needs to, it needs to have its own little bike helmet on the tool. This one actually cuts the rakers down so the chain bites pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. It's, it's, a, it's a tool made for people that want the saw to cut firewood, not just be safe, quote unquote. It's a chainsaw, it's not safe inherently. And uh, the, the better it cuts, the, the quicker I'll be done. So this is actually a really good tool, kind of expensive, much more expensive than this. But uh, if you're just using a regular chainsaw file, you'll need a small flat file to touch those rakers. And you probably need a jig to get them all the same, or you're just eyeing them. Uh, this is a good choice. I, I definitely can endorse this tool as saying, you know, this is, this is way better than I thought it would be. A hooker rune like this is kind of a handy tool too if you're loading a lot of wood. Because you can take and, and hook a piece of wood and pick it up with a hooker rune and then fling it into your wagon or onto your truck or whatever. And it saves you bending down and picking it up and bending down and picking it up. I wouldn't say it's essential. But it's an absolute joy to use a hook a -roon or a pick a -roon for uh, saving your back. Now, the other tool that you see here, this is a cant hook. A lot of people call it a PV. They're not exactly the same tool, but they do pretty 90% of the same function. And the idea behind a cant hook is it's just so you can handle moving larger logs like this uh, by yourself. Say you uh, have this section of tree trunk, which probably weighs seven, eight hundred, nine hundred pounds, and uh, you cut it with your chainsaw into usable sections that you can split up. Well, the problem is, is you can't cut down into the dirt with your chainsaw. You're going to be sharpening it and ruining your, your chains all the time. So you cut almost down to the ground in each one of your cuts, and then with your cant hook, you can roll the log over and continue the cuts. So I've made all my cuts through this log. Now I need to roll it over. 
lock onto it for a cant hook. Now with a cant hook or a PV, any kind of a log rolling tool with a big hook on it, that was a very easy thing to do. And now I can do all of these cuts from underneath without getting a whole lot of dirt on my chain. Nothing grabs onto a log and gives you the leverage that you want like a cant hook or a PV. You lock onto it with the jaw and you've got all the leverage in the world and you can roll that log. If you've got big timber, I would say that a cant hook or PV is a must have item. If you've got a lot of stuff that's 10 inches around or, or a foot around or, or you know, anything smaller than 16 inches, you're, you're probably never gonna use a PV. You can probably get away without owning one. But once you start getting up into trees that are 20 inches, trees that are 24 inches, 30 inches, you know, that's, that's a massive chunk of wood. And if it's a fairly straight tree on fairly straight ground, it's just gonna lay there. And there's really, it's hard to find a spot where you can cut all the way down through the wood and, and get a piece of log cut loose. And what happens more often than not is you're trying not to run your saw into the dirt, but there's really nowhere to make a, a cut to sever two logs apart to where you can roll a, a big block over. So, uh, Having a cant hook like this, it, it totally solves that problem, saves your chains, saves your back, and, uh, and it's a really good way to handle big logs. If you don't have big logs on your property, if you've got a lot of small stuff, uh, this is one you could skip. Let me say one more word about axes. This is our, a, a very sexy tool. Lots of people love axes. They like to collect axes, buy axes. It's a tool that has a collectible market. and. Being a tool that collectors like, um, it's got its own folklore uh, around the tool, the ax. And lots of people have a lot of opinions. Let me give you the skinny on, on axes so you don't go down 500 rabbit trails uh, listening to people tell you their opinions on axes. When it comes to splitting, you want an ax that's not sharp. You don't want to be able to cut yourself with an ax that you're going to split with. If you're gonna be felling with it, that's chopping down trees. If you're going to be limbing with it, you want an axe sharp. So what does that mean? It means you want two axes. You want one that's thinner and sharper for doing your cutting work. And you want one that's thicker and dull for doing your splitting work. Splitting with a good sharp axe, there's no need for it. It introduces a danger that's you don't need to have in that particular chore. You want your splitting ax to be dull enough that you can't cut yourself with it. As far as hatchets go, your hatchet's gonna depend on what you use it for. If, you, if you're gonna be just splitting kindling, get a fat hatchet that's dull. If you're going to be limbing branches off a tree, get a thin one that's sharp. That's the whole subject in a nutshell. Here's a standby, the wheelbarrow. There is no homestead in the world that couldn't benefit from owning a wheelbarrow. You're gonna find a million uses for a wheelbarrow. Well, hey, Hobes. What's going on, buddy? Look at this guy. He likes his wheelbarrows, too. Anytime you need to take a large amount of something, something more than you want to put in your arms, and move it from point A to point B, a wheelbarrow is probably gonna be the first thing you're gonna reach for, unless you own a utility trailer and something to pull it with. Now this is one of the most important utility items you could own. It's not a necessity, but it's so close to a necessity, I would say it's kind of a must-have. And that's just a little utility trailer. This is for hauling wood, it's for hauling junk out to the back 40, hauling brush, hauling whatever. Now a utility trailer like this is basically a wheelbarrow 2.0. If you've got a quad or if you have a lawn tractor, this is gonna do 99% of the work that you would use a wheelbarrow for. This wagon really has no purpose unless you have something to pull it with. So let me show you my preference for uh, something to pull it with. Now when it comes just to all around utility, I don't think you can do better than a garden tractor. A garden tractor can double as a lawnmower. It can double as a, a small little tractor to rototill with, with a rototiller attachment. 
You can plow snow with one. I throw a set of wheel weights on the back, a set of tire chains, and I put my small plow on the front. It takes about an hour and a half to plow a 200 foot driveway and a large parking area. So a little tractor like this has, has just so many varied uses to it. There's, there's so many things you can do with it, not just hook a, a wagon to it and pull it around, but that is a very important aspect. Honestly, I think I have maybe $275 into this wheel horse. The other wheel horse I have, I've got maybe 150 in it, including a new battery. I've had both these tractors for, I don't know, three or four years now. I never run out of things to do with them. The reason I like a wheel horse is I think it's probably, it's the combination of the simplest garden tractor to work on, but also the uh, one of the toughest. It's got a big cast iron rear end, big cast iron Kohler engines in them. They're just pretty bulletproof. For a few hundred bucks, you can pick one of these up. It'll do a lot of the work that you'd have to do manually otherwise. All lawn tractors have plenty enough power to pull around a cart full of whatever you want to stuff in it. If you don't have a quad and you don't have a, a small pickup that can get in and out of tight places, a lawn tractor is a, a wonderful thing to add to the tool pile. Definitely not a necessity, but you know, for a couple hundred bucks, it's a big upgrade. Ironically, when it comes to living off grid, one of the most important tools that you're ever going to need is a generator. Now for some people they're going to be like, no you can't have a generator. Being off grid is about no electricity. Well not to me it's not. Being off grid is about not paying a bill every month to the electric company. Not paying a bill to the water company because you've got your own water figured out. It's about having the, um, the ability to take care of those things yourself in-house as you see fit. Not paying 40 bucks a month just so the power company's got a line to your house no matter how much power you use. But a generator will run all your power tools for building, make your building process go much, much smoother, give you a kind of a, a modern building process as opposed to running hand saws and hand tools. Generator will also charge anything that you need to charge. Uh, battery chargers for your car, you know, if you're, if you don't have grid power, and you leave your lights on or something like that the next day you don't have you know your battery's totally dead just a little battery charger plug it into your generator charge your battery up at home just a million things you know lights you just want to hook it into a, a, a wired system in in an off-grid house kick it on for a few hours light the place up listen to the radio whatever a generator is pretty much an essential item and if you happen to be at that group of people that are so against electricity, they just, they want to be totally, totally uh, rustic, totally old fashioned. For those people that are in that camp, just realize that you're watching a video on the internet about off-grid living. So you're, you're not that serious about being completely disconnected anyway. So when it comes to the three groups of tools that you're going to need in a homesteading project, you got your mechanic tools, you've got your, your land and farming type of tools, and then you have your building tools. If you're going to build anything, you're going to need a set of building tools. The good news here is that the tool list that you need for building is pretty small. It doesn't have to be fancy, it can be very limited, and it can get the job done. Let me show you what a minimalist tool set looks like that you're going to need to build a garage or a cabin. I think you'd be surprised. Now almost every building I've ever built has used this particular set of tools or some variation of it. You can't build anything without a tape measure. A nice little small hand square, or a speed square is even better, but I don't have one handy. I'm not sure where I put it. Uh, a chalk box for chalking a line on sheet goods like plywood and OSB. Uh, very, very handy, pretty much a necessity. A level. This is a two foot, but I generally always use a four foot level. A uh, good solid framing hammer, a handsaw, an extension cord, and then over here a set of paddle bits and a, a set of hole saws. Not exactly something you're going to use all the time, but you're going to find that you do have a use for that. Going down here to the bottom, just a, a standard corded drill. You'll find a million uses for it. You'll use it all the time. Uh, just a standard circular saw, nothing fancy there. Now up in Alaska where I've done 90% of my building, I use a good heavy duty worm drive skill saw, but uh, this does just fine. It'll work and a very, 
This is an affordable model, probably cost you $50 in the store. Although it's not a necessity in building projects, due to the fact that I've built lots and lots of log homes, I'm going to add a chainsaw into that group of essential tools because building log houses, a chainsaw is pretty much a go-to tool. Use it all the time for everything. Now there's a lot of stuff that you could add to that kit. One of the first things you might want to include would be like a sheetrock T-square. Uh, what a T-square does is anytime you've got a sheet good, like plywood or OSB, you just set the T-square on the material and you can, uh, you can use it as a straight edge to make a good 90 degree cut. Whether you're cutting sheetrock with a knife, you hold the, hold the square in place and just use your knife along the edge. Or if you're cutting plywood, you can, uh, you can use it, you know, put it up against the edge and then you've got a 90 degree surface to mark with with a pencil. Basically a drywall T-square like this takes the place of a tape measure and a chalk line. Measuring out two spots and chalking a line between them. This is a lot faster. It's like a $15 tool. It, it, it is beneficial to have. It's definitely not a must-have. I would say one of the most beneficial things about a tool like this is it's a good usable straight edge. But if you have a four foot level, which you should, there's your straight edge anyway. Not a necessity, kind of nice to have. Two other tools that I would add to that list. Air protection. A good set of headphones like you'd use for, uh, for shooting pistol or running a chainsaw. Ear protection is one of those crossover tools that it, it finds its way into all the different categories of homesteading tools. Good, just a, just a regular set of earplugs works fine. A lot of times I'll keep a set right in my hip pocket, my pants. They get dirty, they get uh, dusty, and you're sticking them in and out of your ears. Not ideal, but it's good to have them on your person. Sometimes it's better just to have a set of earplugs in your pocket because they're always on you and you don't have to go looking for them. The other thing I would say, um, one of the must-have construction tools is our short-handled sledgehammer. This could be a long-handled sledgehammer too. Doesn't have to be a short handled sledgehammer. Whether it's land tools, whether it's maintenance tools, mechanic tools, or whether it's construction tools, uh, a sledgehammer is going to find a place. It is a must have tool. Now, when it comes to a hammer, basically what you're going to want is you're going to want a hammer that you feel comfortable with. Hammer that feels good in your hand, something you just like the ergonomics of. Doesn't feel too heavy, doesn't feel too light. This particular hammer has been on every single construction job I've ever been on since the summer of 2000. This thing has been through hundreds of concrete jobs and half a dozen home building projects. This has probably had, I don't know, eight or nine handles on it. It's just as good as the day I bought it. It's like a 21 ounce fawn. It cost me 19 bucks. Just pick the hammer out that you like. Now another tool you're going to find a lot of use for is a sawzaw or a reciprocating saw. A sawzaw is not a must have tool, but it's close enough to it. You may want to just add it to your kit before you get started. You will find a use for it. It's going to come in handy. It's going to be the tool that's the right tool for a specific job at a given time. Not to say you couldn't work around not having one of these, but you know, if 30 bucks isn't a, isn't a big deal to you, go pick one up. Now when it comes to construction tools, that's about all you really need. You can pretty much get everything done that you're going to need to do in the world of construction with just a basic set of tools like that. You know, your project is your project. If you wanted to take a project from the ground up with nothing but hand tools, the kit would be about the same. Maybe uh, the paddle bits you'd replace with a brace and bit and auger bits and uh, the hole saw, you know, you'd have to figure that out too. Other than that, you'd be running a handsaw for everything a sawzall would do, running a handsaw for everything that a circular saw would do, and the drill would be replaced with a brace and bit, and everything else is basically the same. Framing walls, sheeting walls, cutting rafters, nothing has really changed in the last 500 years in those regards and a simple tool set like this will get the job done now You could step that game up with a table saw nothing wrong with that uh, I don't find that I need a table saw as much as you would think you would in a construction project with a couple saw horses You can rip plywood and OSB with a circular saw just as easy And, and it's not as much of a hassle because you're working the saw along the material, not the material along the saw. If a compound miter saw or a chop saw would come in handy, I find that those really shine 
when you're doing a lot of production and you can set them up in a stationary area and make all your cuts you know at one time and, and set your angles on your on your miter saw I never have felt like I was missing something by not having a miter saw on a small project basically any tool that you want to add to this group can make your build more efficient but I think there is definitely uh, there's a, a point of diminishing returns where this widget is going to make this part of the project go faster, but it's going to cost as much as something that's way more valuable. For instance, you bought a sliding compound miter saw. You could do a lot of your angled cuts in your rafters, but that's going to cost as much as a 250 gallon water tank to do like a rainwater catchment system. So in my mind, I could forego a tool like that and put that money towards something that would maybe be more important in my mind for an off-grid cabin. Choice is yours, but a minimalistic toolkit like this is basically all you need to get the job done. Let's take a look at another must-have tool, or tools in this case. These two tools are absolutely indispensable. A good file and a good sharpening stone. When it comes to a sharpening stone, this is a Norton India stone. I've had this sucker for years and years. It's sharpened thousands of knives. It's a good quality fine grit stone. When it comes to stones, there's no way to waste money quicker than to buy a cheap junk Chinese stone. Buy, buy a good quality stone. Norton is a great brand for abrasives in general. Get a good sharpening stone. You don't have to buy it new, buy it used on eBay. Now in the world of files, it's very easy to waste your money on, on a pack of files that seem to be a bargain, but uh, what you really want a file to do is to file metal. If it doesn't file metal, it has no purpose whatsoever. It doesn't have another use. So you want a good quality file. Basically, you're looking at a Simons file or a Nicholson file. There's a thousand companies out there that sell files. Great Neck sells files and Stanley sells files and probably Irwin. And then every store has got their own store brand of files. They're probably all made in China in a factory that could make the world's best file. But that's not what they make. They make a file that they can sell for $3 at a box store. And it's not going to be the best file. If you want a really good file, get a Nicholson or get a Simons and, and just be done with it. Put it out of your head. It's going to be a quality tool. It's going to be as good of a tool as you can buy in that particular category. And every time you need something sharpened, you've got a good useful tool. You didn't waste your money on, you know, some Asian rimmed manufacturer's version of a file that doesn't really work well. So at this point, we've talked about the tools that you're going to need to build. We talked about the tools that you're going to need for your land. Now let's talk about the tools that you're going to need for maintenance. And that's mechanical maintenance. Whether sooner or later, everything you own, and yourself included, we're all falling apart. You're constantly going to need to be repairing things that are mechanical. And if you're living off-grid, you have to have a mechanical aptitude or you have to be willing to learn or you have to have a bunch of money to, to give to other people to have them fix your problems for you. One of those three things, you really can't get around it. Everything that we have that has an engine, that has nuts and bolts, it's all going to fail at some point. And it's up to you to make it work again. So let's run through a good basic set of mechanic tools that you're going to need to keep all the nuts and bolts in your life bolted and nutted together. So when we talk about screwdrivers, you're going to want a very basic set at the minimum. And that is a heavy duty regular and heavy duty Phillips, a medium duty regular and medium duty Phillips a smaller Phillips, a smaller regular, which I'm short one screwdriver. And then you're going to want a couple small screwdrivers and just a regular blade being probably more important. The reason for the small screwdriver is everything that has a carburetor is going to need adjustment. That's line trimmers, lawn mowers, lawn tractors, chainsaws. Uh, you're going to need a small screwdriver just to do carburetor adjustments on a lot of different things. You're also going to need a full set of wrenches. That is a full set of SAE wrenches and a full set of metric wrenches. 
Same goes with sockets. You're gonna need a full set of SAE sockets, a full set of metric sockets. Deep well sockets are very important. Anything that's got a, a long bolt with a nut towards the end, you're gonna need a deep well socket for. As far as ratchets go, you're gonna need a, a ratchet to match your sockets, whether it's a 3 8 or a half or a quarter. I would say uh, in a perfect world, you'd have a set of half inch sockets and ratchets. You'd have a set of 3 8 and you'd have a set of quarter because some things you're gonna need a, a smaller ratchet to get into areas and you can use a quarter inch or maybe it's just a, a light duty application. You can use a 3 8 or a quarter. Heavier stuff, that's gonna need a lot of torque that you might throw a cheater bar on. You're gonna want a half inch drive. You're also gonna want a breaker bar. Now this breaker bar is just to get a bolt or a nut to come loose without putting so much strain on your ratchet. You're also going to want a full set of extensions. Yeah, short extension, medium extension, long extension. You got to have extensions because you're going to need them sooner or later. You can add to that a couple specialty tools. This is an adapter that goes from a 3 h drive to a half inch drive. It also has a hole in the middle where you can stick a pipe through it and just use it as a breaker bar. This is a universal adapter. And this allows you to basically uh, use a ratchet kind of around a corner. Helps to get to some of those hard to get to areas where you can't just go straight onto a nut or a bolt. You kind of got to be off at an angle. Very valuable thing to have. And as far as adapters go, of course, this is the other adapter that goes from a half inch to a 3 h drive. All of these are, they're not must-haves, but you'll probably find that you need them sooner rather than later. You might as well pick them up. Like that half inch drive set, this is a 3 h drive set, and this is pretty much complete. It's got uh, standard, it's got metric, deep wells, it's got extensions, it's got adapters to go from quarter to 3 8 uh, It's got a, a quarter inch driver and a ratchet and a set of Torx bits. Nice, nice little set. I use this more than my other set, but it is pretty light for heavy work. That's why the half inch drive set that I just showed you is, is just as important as this set because they will both find uh, their own things that they're better at than the other set. Let me give you a little piece of advice about sockets and wrenches. You probably will need every socket in your socket set at some point. You're probably gonna need every wrench in your set of wrenches at some point. But certain sizes are the standard when it comes to just manufacturing in general. You might as well have three or four half inch wrenches. There's be a lot of times where you're using two at the same time. Same thing goes with 10 millimeter in metric and 13 millimeter in metric. Make sure you've got a few 10 millimeter sockets, a few 10 millimeter wrenches, same with 13 millimeter. And, and in the, the SAE, I would say half inch. Make sure you've got a few half inch wrenches, a few half inch sockets, because so many times you're, you're gonna be using more than one at the same time. Also, because you're using that tool more than other tools, it's the one you're gonna lose the most. It's kind of a joke in the mechanic world uh, of uh, locating your 10 millimeter socket you're always using them so they have much more of a chance of being lost in this place. Now unfortunately I would say that this is another must-have set of tools and what this is this is a set of Torx head uh, driver bits. Now a Torx head looks like this basically a star patterned bit that fits inside of the, the head of a, of, a, of a Torx bolt. Lots of times you'll find a Torx screw or a Torx bolt as an anomaly it's just in the middle you're in the middle of fixing something and there's a torx head where everything else has been a screw or a bolt there'll be a torx head in the mix you know truthfully i'm not really sure what the benefit of a torx drive screw or bolt is but manufacturers seem to like to stick them in certain places for certain reasons i don't know how many times i've been working on something and everything's going fine uh, you're just turning wrenches and you're, you're getting the job done and then bam, there's a Torx head bolt. If you don't have a full set of Torx head drivers or tor at least Torx head bit, kind of going to be dead in the water. So you might as well face it right up front, get yourself a set of Torx drivers and uh, you're good to go. Now one tool that's kind of a luxury item but you'll definitely find use for it is a cordless drill. There's simply a million things you're going to do with a tool like this from drilling holes to driving screws to cutting holes with a hole saw and you don't need a cord, you don't need a generator. All you do need 
is a way to charge the battery pack, which you can do with a, an inverter in a car. It's no problem whatsoever to plug the battery charger into the inverter in your car or pickup truck. Plug in your inverter and then charge your battery pack. This can't do anything that a drill can't do, but it is super handy. Uh, but again, you know, it's expensive and you could put that money somewhere else. But if you've got extra cash, and uh, you probably already own one of these anyway, it's a fantastic tool and you'll find yourself grabbing it all the time. Here's another group of tools that you cannot do without in any repair kit and that is pliers. You're always going to need a set of needle nose pliers for something. I would add to that, uh, these are a set of kind of duck build needle nose. They're kind of a flat, thin type of uh, set of jaws. I use these all the time. Another great set of pliers. This is a set of side cutters. A lot of people call them dykes. These are, uh, these are for cutting wire. I would not say that these are a must-have plier, but you will definitely find a use for them. These are a set of lineman's pliers. This is one of the reasons I would say that a set of dykes are, are not essential. Because lineman's pliers have a nice set of side cutters. They're going to do the job that these do, but they also have a nice sturdy set of jaws on the end. So this is actually a, this is a set of pliers you're going to use for a lot of different things. It's the set you're going to use to cut wire and pretty much nothing else. And of course, the ubiquitous vice grip. I have probably 10 sets of vice grips. Every one of them is a little bit different. And if, in case you have no mechanical aptitude and you're totally unfamiliar, these are just a locking plier. They have basically a kind of a locking action where they will snap down tight and, and lock. There's a million uses for vice grips. If you don't have at least a few sets of vice grips in your toolkit, you probably uh, want to put that on your list because you'll need them at some point. They're, they're pretty much an essential tool. And when you're talking about essential tools, one of the must-have tools in an off-grid homestead is a set of lineman's pliers and a roll of tie wire. There's actually a roll of wire inside here and it's, it's wrapped in duct tape just to keep it from unraveling and spooling all out. You'll find tie wire at Lowe's or Home Depot in the in the concrete section. It'll be by the rebar, it'll be by the steel stakes. Its number one application is in like structural steel. Iron workers use this to tie rebar together and then they pour concrete on top of all of it. So it's generally you'll always find it in the concrete section. It's just a utility wire. Now if you have a roll of wire and you have a set of lineman's pliers, you can fix a million things. This will do everything that duct tape won't do. If the transmission falls out of your car, you can put 50 strands of this wire together and make a cable and hold it up. You can fix leaky hoses that are loose on the end by putting a couple wraps around and giving it a little twist. There are a million things that you can do with tie wire and a good set of pliers. So I would say that this tool or combination of tools is an absolute must have. And the last set of pliers that I would say you'd want in your kit is a set of wire pliers. Now these are for uh, anything that you're doing where you're stripping insulation off wiring, whether that's wiring lights or whether it's uh, working on the wiring systems in your car or in your lawn tractor or whatever. I know this is a video about off-grid living, but unless you're 100% electricity free, your life is still full of wires and this is the tool you need to work on anything with wires. So as you can see throughout this video, a lot of tools are just multifunction tools that you're gonna use whether you're clearing land or whether you're building or whether you're doing maintenance on your other equipment. Now let me give you guys what I think is probably the number one tool that you can own during an off-grid homesteading project, a pocket knife. Now, you don't have to have a pocket knife. You can have a, uh, you can have a belt knife, you could carry a utility knife. It's just one of those things. You're never going to not need some kind of a little cutting tool. You might have trees to trim and you've got a tree trimming knife used a couple times a year. You might have brush that you're cleaning up and you use a machete a couple times a year. But a utility knife or a pocket knife or, or a small belt knife, you're gonna use it probably every day, probably several times a day. Doesn't have to be fancy, doesn't have to be expensive. All it's gotta be is good quality, as sharp as you can get it and in your pocket when you need it. But there you have it. Those are the three categories of tools. Whether you're uh, just moving onto a piece of raw land and developing the land, whether you're developing the land to build on, 
whether you've got something built and you're kind of settling in as a homestead, those are the three groups of tools that you're gonna always find need for. And of course, your idea of what you wanna do on your off-grid homestead is gonna be different than mine. And you can add to those tools as you see fit, but you probably won't subtract from them because those are the tools that everybody needs if they're gonna build an off-grid homestead. Thank you guys so much for watching Bush Radical. My name's Dave Whipple. Be radical, eh? See you soon.